Ninth Story Studios, giving story a voice. This podcast is part of the Dark Myths Collective. Visit darkmyths.org to discover more shows like this one. The darkness awaits. Listening to the Wicked Library. <laughs> hey everyone, our friends over at USB Memory Direct wanted us to pass along the fact that they have a little contest going on now through the 30th of October. So, not much time left. You can find a link in our show notes today to usbmemorydirect.com forward slash blog forward slash 31 dash days dash horror dash giveaway. They are giving away a Halloween-themed gift box featuring a brand new 32 or 64 gigabyte Ubi Ninja flash drive, as well as some other goodies in there. Again, click on the link in today's show notes and find out how to win. Warning. If you haven't figured out that the Wicked Library has strong themes of an adult, sometimes violent and decidedly scary nature, then by all means, keep listening. Go on, it's just that you're not going to complain about it. Oh, you can try, but you'll be scoffed at and ridiculed mercilessly by the host, the narrators, the producers, and you could bet your dangling participle me. Go ahead, try it. You're not going to like it one little bit, but our millions of listeners will eat it up. <laughs> and that's not hyperbole, kiddies. So there's your warning. Enjoy the show, kiddies. <laughs> Hello, and welcome to episode number 821 of the Wicked Library. I'm Daniel Foytek, and I thank you for listening. We do have something special coming out very soon, and we're going to give you a little peek at it early. This is a trailer for our new anthology for our show, The Lift. It contains stories by many of the authors from this show that you enjoy. We're really proud of it. Here's a listen. Let's go for a ride. There are many stories here. Like this place. Like many things here. Some have become lost. But all lost things yearn to be found. And all stories long to be told. I've searched through my building, gathering up stories from every floor. From the basement to the ninth story, and every floor in between. Stories of choice, of the hopeless, the redeemable, and the lost. Stories that will unlock something inside of you and carry you through fear to your future. Get your copy of The Lift's First Anthology on Amazon in print and Kindle. Let's go for a read. (laughs) Today's episode is a special one as we lead up to our Halloween episode, which will feature our production of Al Going Back's Last Man in Line. Today, though, we have an assortment of tricks and treats, with 17 dark flash fiction tales written by multiple authors and told by a delightfully wicked assortment of voices, all accompanied by a custom music score written by our resident composer, Nico Vitese of We Talk of Dreams. And for this special episode, we're doing something we've never done in our main show before. We've convinced the librarian himself to tell several of today's stories in the way only he can. Please, if you enjoy the stories you hear on our show, find the work of the authors and buy their work. It keeps them making more. You can learn more about all of our authors and find links to their work at their bio pages at thewickedlibrary.com. Now, let's get wicked. Hello, 
Hello, kiddies. You know who I am by now. Sit down and relax while you can. Your librarian has taken such good care of you for seven seasons. I see no need to lighten up for season eight. Hold on to your breath, kiddies. It might just be your last. Once again, it's story time at the Wicked Library. <laughs> We'll start out with this tale, told by me. The Scratching by Ricardo Victoria The scratching started as a uh, noise at night, perhaps caused by the blinds rubbing against the wall. It was a hot summer night. The breeze cooled the room, but the noise was too much. I had to close it. The red moon shone, and I could swear I saw a shadow prowling beneath the window. Ignoring it, I went back to my bed, expecting it to be the end of the matter. (sighs) How wrong I was. The scratching continued even when the window was closed, even when whole days had passed, and it escalated. I could hear it when I showered, when I talked to my wife, at work, everywhere, all the time. (sighs) The ever-present scratching didn't have an identifiable source or a way to make it stop. When I heard it, my head itched. It itched so bad that once I scratched my scalp so hard, I made myself bleed. My wife took me to the doctors, but their studies couldn't find anything. And yet, I heard it, even felt it inside my head. It became my torture, my obsession. The scratching was the only thing I could think of all the time. I had to get rid of it. I researched endlessly, looking for its origin starting with scientific causes and ending with urban legends on crackpot websites. They mentioned otherworldly creatures that preyed on our defects. At first, at first, I discarded them as nonsense. But as my obsession grew, the sightings of the shadow increased. I was going mad. After several months, I simply disappeared, my obsession having consumed all my life. I left my wife. I couldn't submit her to this torture. My craziness was hurting her. I started living in a dingy motel that was undergoing renovations. My sole companion, my laptop fueling my quest for answers. And one day I discovered the only noise able to soothe my troubled existence. The noise of a drill working through a wall. And that gave me an idea. I can't recall what else happened after that. I know, uh, I know I'm alone, but I, I, I can't recall why. I can't even remember my full name now. Not like it matters anymore. Scratching, scratching must end one way or another. I find myself in the bathroom of my dilapidated room, holding a blood-soaked drill in my hand. Grit and blood cover the walls of the bathroom. Is... Is that... Is that my blood? I... 
I can't feel anything now. Not even my face. I'm I'm in front of the mirror. My brain exposed and pulsing. Tall, thin creature with a pale face, shrouded in darkness, appears behind me. Its long fingers with pointy ends caress my brain. With a bone-chilling voice, it says, The creature takes a bite of my brain. And for the first time in a while, I feel a measure of relief. (sighs) Next up, a story told by your librarian himself. The Twisted End of Vernon Boggs by Brooke Wara. They came knocking at his ever-locked door and showed him the papers, while their smiles slithered across their skeleton jaws like hungry serpents disguised in human flesh. They offered him a bit of coin for a bit of dilapidated house. A house, he whined, he had not set one moldy foot from in thirty years. They tried to peek in, tried to put shiny shoes in the doorway and nudge the outside in. He held fast to the doorknob, reached one warty hand out, glared with one scab eye at their repulsed faces, and took their stinking papers before he slammed the door. They gave him no choice. The bulldozer would come whether he stayed or went. He would take nothing with him, he decided. He would go deep into the forest where he could lay his matted head down in the moss and the muck, and not be bothered. So, Vernon Boggs fled into the autumn night, achingly slow on his little-used legs, bent at the waist from decades of rocking in his favorite chair among the dust motes that had settled around him. A mist of cobwebs drifted behind him as he trudged through the thickets. The spiders that had made a home in his head dropped from him, and darted into the underbrush to find new, less shifty homes. He resented their treachery. As he watched the creatures scuttle away on fragile bones across the rotting forest floor, he wondered if the shiny-shoed people had found Mother in the cellar yet. That first terrible traitor who had conspired to uproot him from his happy home. "'You're grown now, Vernon,' she had said. She had been splitting firewood for the winter ahead while Vernon stacked the logs. Every fall of the axe upon the wet stump had made a sound like splitting flesh. Squish, you could have a family. Squish, you could meet a nice girl. Squish, he'd grabbed a hold of his head. Can you hear that? Hear what? His mother continued to chop at the meat of the stump. I'm just saying, Vernon, you can't stay here for squelch. That had been the sound of the brick in Vernon's hand as it sank into a skull. He would not leave that house if he could help it. And now, neither would she. She still lay there where he had left her, among the shadows that had hidden his sin. There had been a flurry of scritchy scratch noises that had carried most of her away. They would find the bones, though. The bones were what was always left when you crushed things with heavy hands. He decided it didn't matter now and pressed on, dragging first one jelly-fleshed foot and then the other in his sluggish descent into the woods. Eventually, he found a boggy little cluster of trees to settle down in. He laid his aching body among the mossy ground and proceeded to burrow into it. At last, no one and nothing could move him. No glossy-suited snakes in people's skin could find him here. He sighed heavily with relief as the dirt settled over the soft yolks of his eyes. When he slept, he did not fear the sounds of the animals. 
The old home had been a teeming nest of vermin that skittered across him as he slumbered. For this same reason, he did not fear hunger in his new home. He did not fear thirst as he scooped handfuls of festering woolly water into his decaying mouth. What he did fear was the creaking. At first, it came from the sounds of the trees, their low, mournful groans as the wind passed through and shook their motionless bodies into unwanted movement. They lolled their heads and twisted their arms in protest as the gale pressed down upon them. All the time, they moaned painfully, and Vernon understood them. But soon the creaking had ceased to come from outside of himself. The rasping filled his ears no matter what way he turned or how he covered them or filled them with bits of moss. Days and days went by and he thought he would be driven mad by the infernal scraping inside his head. Before that could happen though, a new and terrible thing began. He woke to an exquisite pain that snaked through his idle limbs. The creaking inside growing to an ear-splitting hum he could not ignore. He held up one gnarled hand to his filmy eyes and saw with great fascination the knuckles of his fingers and the knobs of his wrist bones protruding gray through his skin. The veins in his hands and down his arms were rivers of some black sludge. He watched as they pulsed beneath his flesh, seemingly growing wider with each throb. The ooze fled through every capillary in his body, down to his toes which bowed in remonstration to the invading matter. He desperately struggled as his flesh flaked away in curls. It turned white, then scaly, then wispy and crumbled off. He watched it harden in patches as elsewhere inside himself there were a great many snapping noises. His body was thrust upward by the force of all his limbs contorting at once. His hands shot out high above his head as they had not been since the day he brought down the brick upon his mother's skull when she had, with her back turned to him, mentioned in passing that he might like to go out into the world and make a life of his own. The tips of his fingers were the first to rupture. Bright green shoots grew from his nail beds and sought the daylight that filtered through the canopy of trees. His kneecaps were the next to burst. Spindly tentacles whipped into the air. From his legs sought the marshy ground and plunged into it with their spiky ends. His body became a spiral, stretching taller as each vertebra popped and separated his pink flesh tearing open to reveal knotted gray scales underneath. There was a final snapping sound as the last of his bones cracked and his flesh split wide and fell away. From then on, his days would be filled with the ever groaning, that always creaking, that infernal hum of a million moaning fibers each time the breeze caressed his new body. There, Vernon Boggs stood forever, suffering every season as his leaves curled and turned to brittle gold, fluttering away from him to the forest floor. Birds would nest, vermin would gnaw at his flesh, and Vernon Boggs would let out an internal, eternal scream only the forest could hear. <laughs> Next up, Nicole Goodnight, with a tale by Kelly Perkins. I stretch my jaw and wonder, who will I be today? I sent my query on the suburban breeze. One whiff, that's all it takes, and so goes my shape. I fill this skin more often than I'd like. I'd say, judging by my stature, my bouncing blonde ringlets, he's a man of particular tastes. I feel his eyes follow me. Myself sat upon as by a pack of wild dogs, barking and tearing at me, even as the convenience store door jingles closed behind me. I'm a ways down the candy aisle when it jingles open again, 
His scent strong, even over those overcooked roller hot dogs and little tree air fresheners. He recognizes in me the perfect prey, a dirty and disheveled child of neglect, too young to be unaccompanied. Sloppy, salivating over such a prime slab of meat laid out the way I am on a platter. But he takes the bait. His expensive cologne cannot mask the fatty stink of his insides. Nor does the skin he fills cover his nature as he slides up beside me, pretending to peruse a pack of Twizzlers. The crisp, bright polo and dad shorts might fool his neighbors, but there's no mistaking the fire in his eyes that apparent tears in mine sparks. Where's your mom? He bends to ask me. The sunshine in his voice cannot hide the shadow looming from within him. I... I don't know, I sputter, rubbing my reddened eyes. Well... Come back with me to my house and we'll call her. I could say that she doesn't have a phone. That aeons and darkness separate where I come from and the space we now occupy. But he would only find another, and in between we'd both be hungry. His manicured lawn and idyllic picket fence provide the perfect veneer, even among homes resigned to anonymous mediocrity. The heady scent of his sin is overwhelming as we cross the threshold and the geography no longer matters. Whether it's a room full of toys or a closet full of Oshkosh bagosh tucked away in a house with no kids, it doesn't matter. We won't make it much further than the foyer before my reptilian nature asserts itself. It will be clean, precise, as if neither of us was ever here. The door shuts and the trap triggers. I stretch my jaw and his does too, albeit for different reasons. Unfortunately for him... Mine will always be wider. Fear acts as my fork, spearing him in place. I take him in one snap. So satisfying, that crunch. My mouth blooms with flavor. He screams all the way down. Were you to glimpse his door at the right time on the right day, you might see a young woman exiting the home, picking her teeth. She's in the wind before you think anything of it, already on the trail of her next meal. And when I find him, he'll know, like all those before, I am the elite predator. Pulp by Christopher Long The house was in darkness. It stopped him in his tracks. There was no sound from the TV, no noise from the kids' bedrooms, no sign of anyone at all. A stray flicker of light flared from under the kitchen door, dead ahead. He set down his bag, kicked off his uncomfortable shoes, and headed toward it. Hello? It was strange how different the house felt with the lights off. The uninvited shadows lent an alien emptiness to the place. They'd removed any sense of home, as if it had been scooped out in his absence, leaving only a dim husk of surfaces behind. The pumpkin was waiting for him on the kitchen counter. That was a surprise. Izzy normally wasn't into Halloween. She'd been raised pretty religiously on her mother's side, at least. Still, there it was, a carved, lit pumpkin just for him. In its fidgety orange glow, he could see papers scattered over the worktop. Confused and exhausted, he stepped into the kitchen, the cold tiles leeching through his socks. As he drew closer, confusion soured, twisted into dread. All the letters Becca had sent him over the years, all the photos. Isabel must have found them. He thought about calling her when he noticed the pattern cut into the pumpkin was facing the wrong way. He took it, turned it. The rough, bulbous skin feeling ripely grotesque between his clammy fingers. Izzy's father had loved Halloween. They'd only met him a few times. He came and went as he pleased, traveling in strange circles. A tall, pale man with a distant stare and a warm grip. I know a few tricks that make your hair curl, he'd said once. The shape Izzy had cut into the pumpkin made him step back. There was no mistaking it. 
He saw it every time he looked in the mirror. It was him. Perfectly, undoubtedly him. Spelt out in negative space and shifting light. Her note showed itself once the candlelight could cast through the sculpted smile. My father taught me how to do this, he read aloud. Leave the candle to die or blow it out. Either way, once it's gone, you'll be gone. He smirked and went to drop the note into the pumpkin, until the uneven red candle at its core caught his eye. The torn fragment of his favorite tie. The photo of him with the eyes removed. A little wrapped packet of what might have been roots and hair. A lingering trace of blood. I know a few tricks that make your hair curl. Helpless and lost in old lies, he sat at the kitchen table. Alone. Unwanted. Wretched. Waiting out the candle as the flame's warmth flickered undeniably through every fiber of his being. He watched it wane. Tensed as it buckled and crumpled and was gone leaving only a reedy, unraveling, curling knot of smoke rising through an empty kitchen in an empty house. A pile of empty clothes sitting at the foot of an empty chair. And now, it's my great honor to introduce a story told by the great David Cummings of No Sleep. Staked by Lydia Peaver When they stuck that stake through my heart, I knew I could use it to my advantage. A brute, buried in this field and forgotten for more than a century, I had fought my way through life and now thought my way past death. Scores of men had met their end under my fists, and women begged not to follow them there. Even my death was as exhilarating as the deaths I caused. I loved it, ending them. So many sent to their bloody, screaming ends. My end hadn't come, and by the time they punched me through with this oak spear, I had stopped wondering why. It took a while for me to comprehend that my soul, or whatever keeps me aware, went creeping up that stake, seeping up from the ground as water feeds live trees. But this tree was dead, and so am I. An unseen someone jabbed this stake through me, lending some excitement between nothing and darkness. For a long while I was trapped in the earth, run through the chest, and silent in my grave. Then I was two places at once, down here in the dirt and up there in the breeze. I could see through eyes long rotted out. Scents and sounds came as if I lived again. I still couldn't move, bound somehow by this stake or my mind. Long seasons passed above ground as I crept into my new body on the post where I watched and I waited. The world changed around me. This field itself, a boon in my time, fell fallow for generations before part of it was tilled and sown again. Village boundaries shifted. Mankind shifted. Everything around me changed, and then I changed too. Dressed and padded, thanked or cursed, mostly left alone. The scarecrow perched on the oak staff in the old field. The scarecrow so often ignored, but occasionally adored or feared. Counting sunsets, watching people come and go... I realized I could move. To experiment, I would stretch my arms left and right, or bend a stiff leg. My slightest motions spooked people. Then, with all my strength, I let myself down to roam free under cover of darkness. It was tiring, but I grew stronger season by season. Once ready... I vowed to find someone and have them meet their end. All I miss of living, you see, is the dying. I can have my way with you. Far stronger than I was in life, I am more brutal too. 
If being buried for so long can't kill me, and the snow and rain can't tire me, don't think you can run away. I know no other way, and for one night a year I can roam among you all undetected. Screams will go unheard, blood on the walkway ignored. You will pass it off as someone's trick when I, the Scarecrow, go missing from the field every Halloween. Once again, your librarian. Like Something Out of a Fairy Tale by Rob E. Bowley. Travis Guy retrieved the tripped mousetrap from the floor of the dirty shed, the one once filled with rotted, rusty spindles. The mouse had traded its life for a slice of gouda cheese, and the trap's hammer had clamped neatly down on its neck. Though Travis had loaded the trap only two days ago, the mouse's head had been stripped down to a tiny skull the size of his thumbnail. An ant scurried over exposed bone. He reset the trap and wiped away sweat from his brow. Summer had stuffed the shed full of humidity. Surprisingly, the dead mouse hadn't stunk up the cramped space. After resetting the trap, he ventured outside. A deer watched him from the thick forest surrounding his rundown cottage. He waved to the deer just for the hell of it. Was it his imagination, or did the deer narrow its gaze? It wouldn't be the strangest thing he'd seen since buying this place. The cottage looked like something out of a fairy tale, with its beautiful stonework and crooked chimney. In the attic, he'd found a crate of child-sized mining gear, a pair of golden slippers, a jar holding a heart wrapped in three metal bands, and several pairs of moldy leather shoes, all filled with holes. While tilling up a patch of barren land for a garden several weeks ago, he had found a red apple with a bite out of it. It had been buried a foot deep, yet somehow gleamed red. He tossed the apple toward an oak tree. The next morning he found a mess of animals, raccoons, squirrels, finches, and mice, lying beside the apple, which now had several more bites missing. He would thought the animals dead, but they were sleeping. No matter how he prodded them, they wouldn't wake. He covered them gently with a blanket and buried the apple. After that, the animals in the forest took a shine to him, as his grandmother would say. They'd eat seeds from his hand and sit with him on the porch. He swore they cleaned the windows when he wasn't looking. Now, he shook his head at the deer. Nearby, a fox watched him too. And squirrels. And birds of all kinds. They looked... Angry. It, it was just a mouse, he said. He gave them all the finger and stomped inside the cottage. That night he slept fitfully. When he woke shortly after dawn, he found himself bound to the bed by a hodgepodge of ropes and vines. A gang of woodland creatures stood over him, their dark eyes at once cold and smoldering. Something furry, clammy, and rotten was stuffed into his mouth, preventing him from screaming. One by one, they took tiny bites out of his face, spitting the pieces of him onto the floor, until his head was nothing more than a skull. Only then did they untie him. They'd left the eyes, so that he could see his horrid reflection in the mirror. The antique one that sometimes whispered. <laughs> Next up on the mic, our good friend, Jessica McHugh. Falling Star by C. Brian Brown The stage contained her life. She gazed at its expanse from the left wing and took in the monolithic mic stands, the mountain of speakers in the rear, and the jumbled outcropping of rock was the drum kit. The crowd provided the tsunami, the raging danger that made each of the items on the stage deadly. But she belonged in the maelstrom. She entered, head held high, to center stage. Thunder. Death. 
She had owned this particular storm for years uncounted. She threw her arms out wide, buffeted by the heathenish noise, bathing and cleansing her soul. It was her due. She deserved this explosion of their love. They owed her. She had it all and climbed to the top of the fame mountain like Sir Edmund Hillary. Her heels, toes, and hands dug into the rock to keep steady. She gave them everything. Talent, beauty, sex. They craved her songs, her memoirs. Her. She told the world what a dirty whore she was, and still they came. Still they loved her. Still they begged for more. More thunder. Overwhelming. Drowning. She bowed at center stage, rose, cupped her tits in silent salute, and screamed. Their energy fronted hers, swirled together into a supercell. Everyone wanted to survive the storm, wanted to see how much damage each one would do. They loved the storm, and she'd given them the hurricanes. Up she went, climbing the set poles to the catwalk above, hips gyrated, a dancing tornado of ass and leg and pantyless cunt. Did they see? Did they notice her at all anymore? There was no applause. Deafen. Dead. She jumped. Once again, today's proverbial bad penny. The librarian himself. You Can Be Always by Lee Andrew Farman. Hollow pumpkins grinned along the street with flickering eyes, knocking, knocking all eve long. The little ghost filled her bag with sugar treats. Monsters and things long dead, faces that normally brought fright, didn't raise her pulse at all. She knew Halloween was the time for horrors that darkness brings. The streetlight went out. She found herself alone, at the end of the road where front stoops had gone cold. An ebon-skinned fairy came to her side. Smooth, shining, blacker than the night, its wings fluttered as it lit on her palm. Fear nearly struck her, but instead wonder she found. Never had she seen such a beautiful thing. Are you a fairy? Sarah asked. It nodded its head and blinked its eyes. Then it took flight, waved its hand in the air. It beckoned her to follow in step, led her deep in the woods, toward a house long abandoned. Sarah pulled at her costume, tried to remove it. The forest so dark, the cloth made it darker, but the fairy tugged back, insisted she keep it. It is Halloween after all, she thought. Everyone should be in costume. The hovering creature took her hand, urged her to follow. Pumpkins lit the porch of the old wooden cabin, their soft light warm and inviting. She hopped to the door, and on its own it opened. Beyond it waited things she never imagined. Things strange, never seen, not even in dreams. Masked creatures came to greet her, some stumbling forth. Their scent was of old, long forgotten. She inhaled the pleasant air let its flavor remind her of what was. You can be always, they said in unison. She smiled at the thought of endless autumn nights, cool air and colored leaves. She allowed them to take her into their place, with willing soul and a walk with grace. You shall become as you are, the voices spoke. The white linen costume tightened around her, she didn't fight the transformation, rather welcomed it instead. She wanted to be there, better than dead. As her feet disappeared and she floated as if normal, she peered through the holes of her ghostly exterior and looked forward to the time with her new family forever. Louis Pollard and Erica Sanderson bring you this next story. Behind you by Pippa Bailey. The keys clicked beneath Paul's fingers as he added another paragraph to his story. 
A cup of pungent coffee sat beside his keyboard. The thick layer of scum rippled in time with his typing. Deep in thought, the words flowed effortlessly as his girlfriend ran her fingers across his shoulders. He liked to ignore her distractions. Pretending not to notice, he continued writing. She stroked a single fingertip delicately against the nape of his neck, sending a ricochet of tremors south. He hammered the keys continuously, a sharp intake of breath his only response. He knew she enjoyed playing this game, testing his control as she attempted to arouse him, but he had a deadline to hit, allowing him no time to entertain her seductions. Warm breath lingered against his ear as her smooth lips played across his neck. A multitude of kisses, puckers of saliva tracing his skin had become cold as she pulled away and left him wanting more. He adjusted his gradually tightening combats, the cotton bulging slightly with his eyes still locked on the screen. Teeth tugged gently on his pulsing earlobe, her warm, sticky breath leaving his skin moist to the touch. She rubbed her hands down his tense body, now littered with goosebumps. Her nails felt sharper than usual, gripping his thigh from behind. She slid her hand further down his left trouser leg, growing ever closer to the source, and he began to noticeably throb. He bit his lip as she reached his inner thigh, running her hand against his bulging zipper. The mechanical click of the keyboard now only sporadically punctured the silence. He enjoyed this game, letting her play, always wanting more but never relinquishing control. His laboured breath signalled her impending victory, Clearing his throat, he consciously resumed typing. His turls curled into the carpet fibres as she wrenched his belt. The metal scraped against the chair and thudded on the floor. She slid a solitary digit down below the waistband, brushing against his pelvis. Knowing she would soon release him, he felt a smile push into his lips. His legs spread slightly. She allowed her entire hand to glide down to the front of his combat. Skin slick with pre she gripped his rigid cock, rotating his constricted shaft upright. The room darkened as she massaged him, shrouding him in a shadow he couldn't fully comprehend. She made quick work of extracting the first few moans from his parched lips, hands falling silently from the keyboard, twitching at his sides. He had lost the game of pleasure again, his slick cock aching in her grip. She knew how to bring him to the point of no return, waiting for the carnality of his relief. But this felt instinctively different. His body convulsed with bliss, his vision clouded, the air humming with electrical intensity. He wanted to turn, to grab her, to pull her onto him, but the signal to move never reached his arms. The overwhelming pleasure reverberated around his body. He could taste it, like fire. Both legs trembled as he drew closer to this all-consuming ecstasy. Paul's ears perked up at the familiar sound of a key in the door. The room grew brighter with the orgasmic haze leaving his clouded head. Baby, I'm back, said his girlfriend from the hallway. You heard the news? There's been more attacks. The shadow danced playfully along the wall as it crept out of the window, off into the night. Here he is, your librarian. The Ghost of Halloween by Jesse J. Saxon The spirits of Thaddeus Cooper and Abner Taggart sat atop the Templeton family mausoleum, watching their friend Eliza Gale recreate her famous disappearing lady act in front of the costume-clad partygoers of Donovan, Massachusetts. The trio had been dead for 150 years since a pox plague during the spring of 1865. Now, in death, the three friends often got together to continue their traditions they had in life by pranking the townsfolk with ghostly activities. However, they especially took pleasure in doing so during Halloween, with everyone already stirred up by the holiday. Over the last century, Eliza had gained quite the reputation for being a ghost of some woman seen on the balcony of the Tidewater Saloon, disappearing just as someone gets a good look at her. Thaddeus had always admired the trick, 
but Abner called it cheap and mundane. This year, Thaddeus, I plan on scaring Donovan so bad that my legend will live on forever, Abner said. And how are you going to do that, my friend? Follow me, Abner said. Abner shot off atop the mausoleum and across the cemetery grounds like an impulse of sparkling phosphorescence. Thaddeus and Eliza followed closely behind, swerving around the headstones and bushes until all three of them flew through the iron fence that surrounded the cemetery. They kept pace, following Abner through the streets, zooming through cars and cutting through people, leaving cold chills in their wake. Finally, they arrived at a home with no Halloween decoration and just the soft ethereal blue light of a TV flashing in one back window. Abner knocked on the door and shouted, Trick or treat, in a voice not his own, but of a child's. As expected, there was no answer at the door. Moments passed and again Abner knocked and shouted, but again no answer. Thaddeus and Eliza looked on curiously but waited for their friend's plan to unfold. The knocking and shouting continued for another hour before a male voice from the inside shouted that there was no candy. Moments later, more knocking, then again, and again, and again. The homeowner checked the door to shoo away the rabid trick-or-treater, but saw no evidence of anyone being there. The knocking and shouting persisted through the night. The homeowner even called the police, asking them to stop the knocking, but the calls were dismissed when patrols saw no one around the property. The knocking continued night after night, causing the homeowner no sleep until he eventually snapped. He turned himself into the police, saying the ghost of Halloween wouldn't let him sleep for not respecting the dead and celebrating the holiday. That he only turned himself in so no one else would suffer the same fate, and the voice of the ghost demanded a blood sacrifice, or it would not rest. See? Abner said. That's how you scare the shit out of people. <laughs> Up next, the very talented Jessica McAvoy. Eleven, by Meg Halfdahl. How long could someone go without sleep? It wasn't something she'd learned in nursing school. There were drugs, of course, to make patients sleep, to send them to that warm and inviting abyss. The notion of utter oblivion, of a never-ending blackness where there were no soiled adult diapers or warbling alarms, made Maya weak with hope. A Google search led her to an article about Randy Gardner, who stayed awake for 11 days in 1965. It was the longest reported case. 11 days, Maya whispered to herself, while biting the narrow, yellow ends off a handful of candy corn. Her own days and nights had melted into each other. Life had become blurry. Sunlight meant nothing, nor did the half-moon shining in on her now. Some days ago, had it been eleven, she'd punched her nurse ID code into the medicine dispenser. She'd stolen Valium, stuffing the tablets into the mess of candy wrappers in her scrubs pocket. At home, she'd curled under her quilts, taken the pills, and waited. Sleep, coy and seductive, never came. That was when Maya knew. It would take something stronger than soothing sleep sounds, than lavender sachets, than Valium. Happy Halloween! Florence, the oldest nurse on the cardiology ward, startled Maya from the dark trail of her thoughts. She drummed her craggy nails on the nurse's station's oval desk. Glad we're not working the ER tonight. It gets nuts. Yeah. Maya blinked at the crepe paper jack-o'-lantern sneering at her from amidst a pile of manila folders. It's Halloween, she added dreamily. 
Florence raised one fuzzy eyebrow. Yep. Well, Mr. Hoffman needs a scrub. His catheter busted open and it was quite a show. I got the dirty sheets changed. Maya studied the old nurse's face. Forty years on the job and she still smiled like a pig in shit when doling out duties. You all right? Florence's grin faded. You look tired. Maya stood on shaky legs. A laugh stirred inside of her chest and spilled out of her mouth like hysterical vomit. (laughs) I am tired. She pushed past Florence, amazed at how the world had taken on the sheen of a dream. The constant beeps, the austere tan tiles of the hospital corridor, everything took on the distinct patina of unreality. Maya entered the claustrophobic closet used for medicines and punched in her four-digit code into the machine. Eleven days, she muttered as she punched in eleven commands for medicine. Her scrub pockets bursting with vials, Maya trudged on exhausted feet to Mr. Hoffman's room. The red nurse's light blinked and whined above her. Good evening, She didn't bother to look at his vitals. The neon numbers wouldn't mean anything to the mush in her skull. I'm afraid I need a bath, the elderly man frowned. Yes! (laughs) Maya laughed again. And I need a nap! (laughs) Her giggles shook her entire frame. She continued to laugh as she injected the fentanyl into Mr. Hoffman's IV line. Maya counted carefully as all eleven doses went in. Envy gripped her heart at the sight of Mr. Hoffman's eyelids dropping. And then, the constant and oddly soothing hum of the monitor. Finally, called to slumber... Maya crawled into the bed beside Mr. Hoffman. Even the screams of Nurse Florence could not pull Maya away from her oblivion. Get your pen and paper out. The librarian has a special recipe for you. Gingerbread Men. Notes to accompany the old recipe by Haggy Johns. By Mike Pilgrim. The trick to making gingerbread men is, unsurprisingly, the ginger. You get that right and all the rest will fall into place. It's like gravity. The ginger must of course be fresh. The store-bought stuff just won't do. They use too many pesticides these days. Something in the chemicals throws the whole mix out true, and let me tell you from personal experience, you don't want to be anywhere near a batch that turns bad. Sift together all the dry ingredients in a wormwood bowl, then add the butter and double the amount of fine grated ginger as listed on the original recipe. Stir until the mixture takes on the consistency of breadcrumbs, then add the wet ingredients. Roll the dough and cut into whatever shapes you want. I've been told that gingerbread genitals are quite trendy at the moment, but that may seem in particularly bad taste if you are giving said gingerbreads to a school or church. Either way, it is of course up to you. I'm a traditionalist myself. Gumdrop buttons and white icing grins. The classics are of course classics for a reason. The baking requires nothing special. Preheat oven to 180 degrees and bake for exactly 13 minutes. If they are in for even a second longer, the heat will kill off the ginger's potency and the batch won't rise. Not ever. You have been warned. If the gingerbread men are overdone, they will still taste delicious. So if you do happen to lose track of time and ruin a batch, you'll have something to snack on while you start from scratch. Packaging is important. I recommend an upcycled biscuit tin. Be careful to make sure they're cushioned. You don't want them breaking. Not before they reach the intended recipient. 
carefully seal the tin with black wax. If done correctly, this will keep them feisty for up to three years. These days, you could use FedEx, DHL, or regular post to deliver your package. If you absolutely must see the look on the recipient's face, drop them off on their porch after dark, ring the doorbell, and hide in the nearby bushes. Note, select your hiding place well in advance and be certain to be well away from the area before the screaming starts. Gingers are famously indiscriminate about who or what they kill once the massacre begins. As I'm sure you know, no other golem does sadistic torture like a troop of fresh-baked gingerbreads. The inescapable sizzle of the extra ginger adds a little something to what was already a particularly nasty temperament. They should be done in about 30 minutes. Happy hexing! <laughs> <laughs> Once again, Erica Sanderson, with a little help from Louis Pollard. Intravenous Sin by Pipper Bailey Let me go! I struggled against straps that bound me to the bed. Red welts throbbed beneath each twist of dirty leather, skin blistered from rough bondage. The room, a wash of blinding white, drowned in the stench of bleach and decay. I heaved. My throat burned with every laboured breath. I have no clue how I got here. It had been ten years since they introduced the Sin Exchange. We lived in the technological age of a Dorian Gray revolution. The wealthy no longer need a tone. Adverts for soul down payments and morality cleansing packages filled the media. It was easy to tell who was buying and selling. A wealthy few, betrayed by their golden glow. The beauty of innocence in an ever-changing world of degeneration. It wasn't long before people sold newborns on the black market. That kind of purity, second to none. Then there were the disappearances. Couldn't afford to pay full price at the facility for an exchange? Greasing a few palms could easily net you an unwilling soul donor. I'd heard whispers about experiments. People being used as lab rats. Doctors investigating the effect of sin. On my return from college, I'd seen my fair share of mass graves. Sloughed skins. Void of life. Void of anything. Stinking piles of fetid meat that had once housed souls, fodder for the gulls. A long needle infiltrated my arm, wielded by a shadowy figure adorned in layers of black rubber. An IV bag of black swirling fluid shook in his hand. Rhythmical drips released its darkness into me, my mind a flurry of words and images. Being tripped in ballet class, Red-hot tears wiped away by my mother's gentle touch. Graduation day. Boyfriend holding me before I took to the stage, adjusting my mortarboard atop my poofy curls. A shimmering black mist spiralled into my memories, like coils of smoke. They choked my mind. My limbs tingled. Heat traversed my palms like dancing sparks. I tried to scream, but only released a slow, juddering rasp. The man's gloved fingers coiled his around the septic IV bag and squeezed. I had my first taste of the business when I'd offered up some purity in my early twenties. I was too young, too naive. Sin swap quickly became a normality for the wealthy and privileged. Folks like myself, the new commodity. I was lucky to have escaped. They never told me who the sponsor was, but all sins needed a human host. The weight of that darkness changed me. Escorted to the back entrance of the facility by armed guards, the recipients queued for hours. They twitched, heads bobbing to the steady drip of black tears, pained breathing and shuffling feet. The tender skin on their limp limbs punctuated by jagged pus seeping holes. We weren't allowed to use the front door, that shimmering silver arch, holographic displays of smiling families and celebrities, quotes looping over loudspeakers, 
I hated the place. But back then I needed the money. I was struggling to pay for my degree and regular work was scarce in Yubo City. I made enough money to survive the last year of my course and gained a little shadow to my soul. Carrying a little extra sin wasn't too bad if you lived clean. But it was those who ate it for breakfast that were the worst. It visibly warped them. The lines of shadow twitching beneath their sallow flesh like ravenous leeches. It twisted their bodies into unseeming shapes as it rotted them from the inside out. These people appeared possessed. Vacant eyes, their sagging skin patched with duct tape. Pools of effluence spilled from gashes in paper flesh. Pulsating bulges of muscle ride like sneaks, as if seething masses attempting to burst from within. Some say this or demons crawl from piles of rotting flesh. Of course, only rumours. I yanked at the straps binding my arms. My brain was foggy, my blood swamped by the black swirling liquid. My skin rippled, the waves of darkness undulated within me. Why couldn't I remember how I got here? The last thing I could remember was going out for a drink after work. Cheap Thrills Tavern, which is not nearly as nice as it sounds. Oh shit, that was it! Idiot! I knew better than to accept drinks from strangers, especially a handsome guy at that bar. Oh, you fucking idiot, Clara! This darkened medical room looked like the facility, smelt like the facility, but the equipment here was crude. Stained beakers and piles of rusty metal implements were scattered on various surfaces. Drained IV bags covered a table beside me. I implored the leather-clad man to stop. Instead, he smiled and slipped three dirty cannulas from his pocket and bored holes into my buckling flesh. I shrieked. A jet of red and black spewed from the punctures. Click. He slotted IV tubes in place. The skin on my shaking hands bubbled and split like melting plastic. Chunks fell from my twisted fingers, revealing congealed black claws. I flexed. The long demonic claws rattled against each other, flicking clumps of tattered red free from curved nails. No. This couldn't be happening. Sour bile filled my dry mouth. Get the hell away from me! I gurgled, spitting mouthfuls of acidic green. I tried to kick my legs free. He smiled and bounced a full IV bag of swirling black in one hand. He gripped my chin with the other, turning me to face him. His hot, tobacco-laden breath smothered me. Licking his lips... He squeezed another bag of sin into my morphing body. I was now only a cocoon for the creature that ride within. This one's nearly empty. Pass me another. He shouted over his shoulder to people I couldn't see. He looked deep into my blurry eyes. You're my latest project. He whispered, his lips brushing my ear. And I can't wait to see your dark side. Up next, he says he's back on his grizzy, young money where are you at, the librarian. Ghoul Quest by Aaron Vleck Ghoul had ventured far from home and lay unconscious in an alley. Not yet fully fledged, if Ariel hadn't found him, he'd never have survived. Ariel was thirteen when death took him but only in the grave a week when Lady Alexandra McBloodbane Pickman, daughter of Richard Upton Pickman, had taken him from the shabby wooden box and brought him to life among the shadows of old world wealth and breeding. True, he dined as did she on the rotted remains of humanity, but his education proceeded under her tutelage as it could never have done in his former life of wretched poverty. Alexandra stood, letting the shadows fall away to reveal her beauty. Austere, gaunt, full of the bearing and pride found only in the old world ghouls of another age. 
Kneeling beside the small slumbering form in Ariel's arms, she brushed her hand across Ghoul's face and touched his eyes with her fingertips. Mama! Ghoul cried out. My child, she whispered, holding him close, though of course they could share no warmth. Lady Alexandra, Ariel said, shall I see he is fed and put him to slumber in the mausoleum? Yes, and thank you for finding him. You are progressing well, Ariel. I shall soon fledge you and set you free upon the world, she said with a smile. Tall and willow-thin, Ariel reached down and drew the child ghoul, no more than a toddler from his mother's arms. She watched as they were swallowed by the fog and disappeared into the mausoleum. Come out now, father, Alexandra said angrily, watching the figure creep from behind a gravestone. Richard Upton Pickman had painted too much from life and even more from the horrors of the nighttime alleys and subterranean passages of the city. You don't like the child I created for you, as once upon a long time I created you as a gift for your mother, my lady wife? Pickman barked. I love my child, but he should never have been my child. If you persist in filling the city cemetery so you can harvest your latest ghoul army, I'm afraid I must sharply protest and stop you by any means required, father, she added, making no attempt to hide the contempt she felt for his practices. Very well, my dear. I'm afraid it's war. War it is, she whispered, sorry to see her father slink way into the darkness. She was sorrier still she must call her grandfather, the greatest ghoul general of the last five millennia out of his final slumber, and her own mother from beyond the sea mists, to put down an impertinent ghoul who refused to confine his activities to the time-honored codes that allowed humans and ghouls to live, after a manner of speaking, in peace. That this impertinent ghoul was her own father saddened her. Then she walked into the mists between the worlds to call the aristocratic ancient dead to arms. Here he is one more time, our good friend, Louis Pollard. Out of the Woods by Mike Pilgrim Monday is a curse. A curse that's plagued our kind ever since the ancestors left the woods in favour of more civilised living. We gave up fresh pine air in exchange for heavy chemical concoctions and traded blankets of stars for the violent buzz of electric light. The bounding and playing must have stopped soon after. I kiss Maddie before I leave the bedroom. She doesn't stir. She never does. She dozes face down like a pup who's fallen asleep in the middle of something important. I envy her sometimes, I love her always. Licking my lips, I wipe the sleep from my eyes and recall the clear sky on Friday night, and how even after all these years Maddie can still fill me with a bottomless joy. She is my best friend, my consort, the other half of our little pack. On the bus, I find myself thinking of the woods again, We could always go back, I guess. Entering the office, I see that Mr Peter Gale is sporting his blood tie, the one he wears when he's in that mood. I don't think he's ever consciously made the connection, but the interns know. They learn pretty fast. I found Smickins crying his eyes out in one of the bathroom stalls last week. Every ecosystem needs herbivores, I suppose. Gina walks past my desk on her way to make coffee. I tell her that if I hadn't found Maddie first, she'd be my number one girl. It always makes her giggle. Her laughter attracts the local predator. Gail tells her that the memo needs to be actioned immediately. His words are sharper than they need to be. She moves like he might pursue, skirt squeezing her behind like hard-boiled eggs wrapped in cling film. Gail takes a long look as he sips his peppermint latte with the elegance of a cow chewing the cud. He leans over my desk to assert his dominance. The pungence of overpriced aftershave punches my nose. 
He says that the deadline has been brought forward, that my 50-page report is due first thing. If it's not up to scratch, he'll make sure I won't even be able to get work flipping burgers. He allows himself the pleasure of a chuckle at his little joke. I imagine that's how tickling a pig would sound. I don't care how long it takes you, just get it done. I say nothing. Well, nothing out loud anyway. During lunch, I step outside to escape the rancid neon glare. I consider other options for earning money. How the meaningless bits of paper represent comforts. Maddie often jokes that I'm too domesticated for my own good. Sometimes I think she might be right. I smell him long before I see him. The scent of his aftershave wafts her head. The harbinger of his post-lunch onion breath. He's looking for me. I can tell by the measure of his footsteps, the squeak of overpriced shoes. I try not to cringe. Mr. Farkas, enjoying the sunshine, I see. I squish a passing ant into the paving with my foot. He doesn't notice. Surprised you can find any time, given your workload. I picture him running through the dark forest, screaming wildly as the hungry wolves close in. I'll have it done. Mr. Farkas, I don't much care for your attitude. What I said before still stands. You don't get to disappoint me. He holds my gaze for longer than would be considered polite. He wants me to roll over. I don't. He breathes heavily in my face. He convinces himself that I fear him. Then he turns tail and waddles off. I do all that I can not to bare my teeth. On the bus ride home, I contemplate options. The moon will be full in 26 days. Then we can slip out of these fragile pink skins and go find that little pig. Shouldn't be hard, not with his scent. Even now, I can feel it coating the insides of my nostrils. Saliva fills my mouth. Afterward, we could leave this all behind. Maddie will be glad to go back to the wild. She's never had much taste for this human charade. I'll tell her over dinner. We're lucky to have him. Here he is. Mike Delgadio. My Return to Evans City by Rich Bottles Jr. Just like the asshole in the movie, every Memorial Day weekend, I make the trek from Pittsburgh to the Evans City Cemetery. (laughs) Except I don't have a ditzy blonde with me to torment. Every year, I come alone to this desolate place to clean up and decorate the graves of my parents. Uh, Mostly to placate my aunts and uncles in the rare event that they should decide to make a surprise inspection of their siblings' final resting place. Anyway, like I mentioned, in case you weren't paying attention, this particular cemetery is usually desolate. But today, as I was retrieving a spade and the fake flowers from the trunk of my car, I noticed a figure emerging from the nearby tree line, slowly limping in my direction through the early morning fog. Seriously? I thought to myself as the man continued to boldly approach me. You know, he looked strangely familiar as he got closer, and then he suddenly raised his gruesome arms towards me. He blurted out a hideous, that just chilled me to my core. I felt like I was going into shock as an intense fear enveloped me. I began to shake. Uh, Somehow I summoned the courage to knock the fiend out of my way so that I could jump into the driver's side of the car. I sped away, my unhinged trunk lid bouncing up and down, and I badly navigated the rough, narrow dirt road. I quickly lost control in a sharp turn, and the last thing I remember was the deafening thud of a large tree in front of me. I don't know how long I was unconscious, but I woke up in just excruciating pain. With a determined effort, I managed eventually to stumble out of my car and start walking to find help. When I reached the clearing, I saw a vehicle in the distance, thank God. As I got closer, I saw a man beside the vehicle. You know, the car, it looked like my car. And the man, 
the man looked like... Oh. Closing out our special flash fiction episode today, Nicole Goodnight with a little help from Cynthia Lohman. My life changed forever when I saw the headless person in the wheelchair. Larissa! Are you listening to me? Ashley asked. That, that man... Th- person has no head. Ashley followed my finger, but our bus had turned the corner and he was out of sight. She sucked air through the space between her front teeth and said, I swear if you embarrass me tonight, Derek and Blake are coming over at 630. Be in your costume and at my house at six. She shook her head. Headless man. Girl, you better tell your mama to get you some meds. Maybe it wasn't a headless person. Maybe it was an elaborate costume. It had to be. I was being silly. The decorations in my neighborhood were on point. A ghost or goblin was everywhere I looked. You could keep Christmas. This was the best time of the year. At five minutes before six, I rang Ashley's doorbell. Instead of the regular ring, a werewolf howled. Her mom, dressed as Elvira, let me in. We were in the Hills subdivision and trick-or-treating by seven. The hall was good. Tons of Milky Ways and Three Musketeer bars. And the decorations? Oh, wow. These folks spent mega bucks. Plastic skeletons, huge spiders and trees, and a massive jack-o'-lantern surrounded the house in front of us. We waited at the foot of the stairs for the kids at the door to finish. Whoever carved the jack-o'-lantern did impressive work. It was scary and lifelike. It winked at me. I shook my head. He winked again. My hand slid out of Ashley's. The side of the pumpkin bulged as a barbed claw punched through, followed by twisted arms. I looked to Ashley. Surely she had seen this, but a giant plastic spider dragged her across the yard. Her arms reached out to me like someone drowning, and her mouth opened, exhaling a head-splitting scream. Several other costume kids were trapped in the tree and twisted against the spider's web. The jack-o'-lantern on the porch sprouted legs and loomed over the child closest to it, a sixth grader from my school. Before the kid could scream, the jack-o'-lantern threw him into his mouth like a piece of candy, his pumpkin jaw stretching like a snake to swallow the boy whole. One sneaker caught on the edge of the pumpkin's jagged teeth. The jack-o'-lantern gulped and the sneaker disappeared into his mouth. Fear paralyzed me in place and I felt nauseous. Blake shook me. We have to run! And run we did. Somehow Blake and I made it through the massacre to the only undecorated building in the neighborhood. We should be okay here. Until the police can get to us. Blake said. I wanted to believe him. But the statues of biblical figures and saints in the church filled me with fear. Not peace. Then one of the statues winked at me. Thank you for listening to today's episode of The Wicked Library. The Wicked Library is a Ninth Story Studios production, ninthstory.com. If you enjoy the show, please consider supporting us on Patreon at patreon.com forward slash wicked library. You can be a part of helping us keep the shows coming for as little as $2 a month. The Wicked Library is proud to have Booth Junkie as one of our Season 8 partners. Booth Junkie is a YouTube channel dedicated to the tech of at-home professional voiceover, created by the very talented Mike Delgadio. You can find the channel by going to boothjunkie.com. We're excited to announce that we have an additional partner for Season 9, but we're going to go ahead and give her a shout-out a little early. Our longtime contributor and interviewer for Season 7, Jeanette Andromeda, has a growing YouTube channel at youtube.com forward slash Jeanette Andromeda. Jeanette is an illustrator exploring the world and creating arty adventures. Watch her channel to see her unique take on art and horror as she shares her process. She's truly one of our favorite people, and we know you'll love her as much as we do. Again, you can find her channel at youtube.com forward slash Jeanette Andromeda. Complete credits and full show notes, including links and information from today's episode, can be found on thewickedlibrary.com. You can also find links to our Twitter, Facebook, and iTunes page. Until next time, go ahead, leave the front lights on. It makes it easier for the tricksters to flash you.